Good evening, welcome to Community at Coast. Glad you guys could join us. So thankful for every one of you that hunger and thirst for the word. You're not looking to be entertained, you're looking to learn. And I'm so grateful for that because that really is what the church is for to edify and equip the body for the work of the ministry. And so, though you're not with me, I'm grateful that you've joined us and that you're able and I'm able to learn together so that we might grow together. We are going to continue with studying God's Word as we're going through the life of Christ, the chronology of Christ. We're going to pick it up in the latter portion of Luke chapter 11, go right into Luke 12. So that's Luke 11 and Luke 12. Now, as we go through these studies, as well as Sunday, you may have some questions, and you can text in your questions to 949 301-7300. That's 949-301-7300 so that you can get your question answered. We may not be able to get to all of the questions that are coming in, but we are picking the questions that seems to be what all the questions are surrounded around so that we can answer as many as we can on upstream. So once again, we're going to be Luke 11, end of Luke 11 and Luke chapter 12. Why don't we go to the Lord in prayer? Father, I'm so grateful for your word. So thankful for the time that we can be in your word together. And I pray that you'd use your word to teach us how to live and how to be. In Jesus' name, amen. The Lord has just spent some time with the Pharisees and it probably wasn't the best of time for the Pharisees. He goes to a Pharisee's house to have dinner and he pronounces three woes on them. A woe like, hey, I'm warning you. Uh, Not just them, but the scribes as well. And they didn't take to being challenged that well. If you take a look at Luke chapter 11, verse 53, And as he said these things to them, the scribes and the Pharisees began to assail him vehemently. They didn't receive these woes very well, these warnings well. And to cross-examine him about many things. I've had this experience before where I've had to give a woe to someone, a truth that they did not want to hear. And they began the vehement attack uh, against truth. And sometimes you take it personally because you're the messenger and they're going to shoot the messenger. But I always try to remember that my responsibility is to give the truth. Their responsibility is to receive. Now, not my opinion, not my, the way that I look at things, but it's from the word of God. And so when I deliver a verse from scripture to show them the right way, and they respond like these Pharisees did, well, let's look at what Jesus had to say. And so, They were uh, vehemently against him, began to cross-examine him about many things. Look what else they were doing. Lying in wait for him and seeking to catch him in something he might say that they might accuse him. So we are looking at the uh, hearings of uh, Amy Coney Barrett, and it's amazing how there are those there that are, well, they're trying to uh, confirm, and there are those there that are trying to dissuade. And interesting, the ones that are trying to dissuade, some of them have been vehement against it, and I'm not saying I'm for or against, I'm just communicating the facts of the event. But those that are against this nomination or this nominee, it's amazing how they're trying to catch words that she has said so that they can almost use her own words against her. Um, That's exactly what the Pharisees are doing. The Pharisees, they are just waiting for Jesus. They're following Jesus. They're just waiting for him to say something that they can use against him. Imagine if you had someone following you and someone, and I call these maybe trolls online, and they're just waiting for you to say something wrong. They're going to take a clip out and they're going to communicate something. They're going to hear some juicy bit of gossip and they're just going to want to say something to get you, actually to kill you. Um, That's what they're up against. That's what Jesus is up against. They want to kill Jesus. So they're just waiting to catch him so they can make a murderous accusation against him. Look how Luke puts it in chapter 12. In the meantime, when an innumerable multitude of people had gathered together so that they trampled one another, he began to say to his disciples, first of all, another version says he began to say to his friends. So he's talking to the disciples And this huge crowd has gathered. Now, in that crowd are Pharisees. They're just waiting to catch Jesus in something. But a crowd has gathered. A crowd has gathered, not to be entertained. 
A crowd is gathered not to be, well, uh, uh, taken care of. A crowd is gathered to hear the word of God. We're approaching the midpoint of the ministry of Jesus, and here he is just teaching the word of God. And he looks at his disciples in front of all of these people, And I wonder if the disciples were thinking, man, we got a big time ministry going on here. Like, wow, we got to put some things in place. We got to make some ministry happen. We got to do something. And they maybe wanted to go the way of the Pharisees and maybe take a look at this big crowd and see how much people are following them. It started going to their head. So Jesus, he communicates to them, beware of the leaven of the Pharisees, which is hypocrisy. Now, if you're a Pharisee sitting in the audience waiting to catch Jesus, this has got to rile you up a little bit. And what I love about classic Jesus is he don't care. He's going to communicate the truth because he's not trying to make the Pharisee look bad. He's trying to help the Pharisee realize it's time for you to change. You know you're a hypocrite. And he says, beware of the leaven. Now, this word leaven is an interesting word. It goes all the way back to the Old Testament. And the Jews understood leaven to be like a representation of sin. Even Paul, when he wrote the letter to uh, the Corinthians, the second letter to the Corinthians, he would say, cast out leaven. In other words, get rid of the sin that's in your life and uh, 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 and fill your life with the Holy Spirit. And so we know that leaven is an example of sin Jesus is using in that Old Testament concept, and he calls the sin out. It's the sin of being an actor, of being a hypocrite. You look like one thing, but yet you're really something else. And he says, I want you to beware of this. Don't look at this crowd and go, man, I'm going to be a leader. I'm going to tell these people what to do. No, 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 no. Don't do it the way of the Pharisees. For there's nothing covered that will not be revealed, nor hidden that will not be made known. Gang, this is a truth about hypocrisy. You may be able to play the actor position for a while, but eventually the truth is going to be known. You may go from friend group to friend group every time something happens in that friend group and think and blame someone else. But then you go to the next friend group because you haven't dealt with the issue in your own heart, in your own life. And you realize the same thing begins to happen. You go to another friend group and you realize the same thing begins to happen. Someone then calls you out and says, listen, you've been here, you've been here, you've been here. It's all been the same problem. Is it possible that it may be you? That you're presenting to be something that you're actually not inside. And Jesus said, listen, one way or the other, whether it's someone pointing it out or you realizing it yourself, it is going to be revealed. So then he speaks to the disciples and he says this, therefore, whatever you, now he's speaking to the disciples, whatever you've spoken in the dark will be heard in the light and what you've spoken in the ear and inner rooms will be proclaimed on the housetops. Now, this is interesting that he would say this to his disciples because what he's dealing with is what the disciples are struggling with. And we recognize that in the next couple of stories that he uses to further explain, he's asking them to be bold and courageous. Listen again, therefore, whatever you have spoken in the dark, in other words, wherever you've spoken where no one can see you, it's going to be in the light, be heard in the light. Whatever you have spoken in the ear and inner rooms, like you, you, you weren't bold enough to be able to communicate to this whole large crowd that's here. You just wanted to be in a small crowd because you're afraid of the Pharisees. He says, listen, beware of the Pharisees. They're, they're, they're just like leaven. They're like sin. You put, it leaven, you put yeast in a little bit of bread and all of a sudden it explodes and it just gets bigger and bigger, that small little sin. And he's saying, guys, listen to me. Don't allow fear Don't allow doubt. Don't allow being afraid affect you. I know these Pharisees, they are putting on you a trip. But he says, I want you to be bold and I want you to be courageous. Take a look at what he says in verse four. And I say to you, my friends, here he's speaking to his disciples. Remember, no longer do I call you servants. I call you friends. My friends, don't be afraid of those who kill the body. Wait a second. Don't be afraid of those who kill the body. Jesus, are you sanctioning martyrdom? Let's go on. And after that, have no more that they can do. Once you're dead, you're dead. But I'll show you whom you should fear. Fear him, speaking of God, who after he is killed, he has power to cast into hell. Yes, I say to you, fear him. 
Now, so many people have said that uh, Jesus never spoke about hell. That's not true. Luke chapter 12, right here in verse 5, he makes it very clear that there is a hell. And what he's communicating here as I read on, are not five sparrows sold for two copper coins and not one of them is forgotten before God. In other words, dead sparrows are remembered by God. And not one of them is forgotten before God, but the very hairs of your head are all numbered. That's how much you mean to God. He knows how many, how many follicles of hair you have on the top of your head. That's how important. This trivial thing about hair, he goes, he's so into you, he even knows how many follicles of hair you have on the top of your head. Don't fear. There it is. Therefore, you have more value than many sparrows. Listen to what he said in verse three. Therefore, whatever you've spoken in the dark will be heard in the light. You can't hide the light of God's word under a bushel. You can't be afraid to communicate just because there's Pharisees in the crowd. You can't be afraid at a restaurant to hold hands and pray simply because other people haven't and you're public. You can't be afraid to say the name of Jesus on an airplane because there's other people that may say, ah, I can't believe you believe in Jesus. No, he's saying, I don't want you to live in fear. I want you to be courageous. And he says, so courageous, so courageous. Don't be afraid of those who kill the body. You see, our faith is supposed to be in the Lord. And the opposite of faith, in fact, the enemy of faith is fear. And there's one thing that all of us, well, if we're honest, possibly fear, and that's death. Now, to the Lord, Precious in the sight of the Lord is the death of his saints. For the Lord, it's just the transition from life on earth to life in heaven. But because we've never experienced it before, and that's true because you're listening to me, and because, well, we worry about, is this, am I going the right way? Have I led the right life? No, listen, when you receive Jesus Christ as your Savior and Lord, there's a truth about your salvation that no one can take it away. And what God is saying here, what Jesus is communicating is, you're secure eternally. And so if they kill you, that's all they can do. But from my perspective, it's just transition straight into heaven. So he says, listen, don't be afraid of those that can kill the body. Rather, fear God. Be afraid of God. Fear God because he's got the opportunity if you don't receive Jesus Christ as your Savior and Lord. Well, you've chosen to go to hell. You've chosen to be separated from God for eternity. And he says, listen, God cares about sparrows. God cares about how many follicles of hairs on your head. That's how much he cares for you. So if he allows you to walk through even martyrdom, be courageous. God's with you. That's a big deal. But not just a matter of that. Take a look at the next story. Also, I say to you, whoever confesses me before men, him the Son of Man also will confess before the angels of God. But he who denies me before men will be denied before the angels of God. And anyone who speaks a word against the Son of Man, it'll be forgiven him. But to him who blasphemes against the Holy Spirit, it'll not be forgiven. Now, when they bring you to the synagogues and magistrates and authorities, do not worry about how or what you should answer or what you should say. For the Holy Spirit will teach you in that very hour what you ought to say. So remember what Jesus said. What you speak in the dark is going to be heard in the light. What you've spoken in the inner ear in the inner rooms will be proclaimed on the housetops. In other words, he's saying, be bold. I'll never forget during the war in Liberia, we all got... Uh, rescued out of Liberia. And we were in Senegal with a couple of other missionaries. One was a younger guy, he's about 19, 20 years old. And five times a day in Senegal, they would call, do the Muslim call to prayer. Well, it was the first call to prayer, I believe it was at five or six in the morning, that uh, my missionary friend went up on the rooftop. And as they started the call to prayer, he started yelling as loud as he could a prayer to Jesus. It woke the neighbors. It woke the missionaries. I mean, he was up on that roof, the epitome of boldness in the country of Senegal, a, a Muslim nation. And here he is praying to the Lord Jesus Christ, trying to drown out the sound of the Muslim call to prayer. That's boldness. And Jesus is calling us to boldness. You see, listen, I don't want you to go into a dark room and just, hey, let me tell you about Jesus. No, this is something, it's good news. 
It's something for you to be bold about. It doesn't hide or cower. You can't hide light. If you make it dark in a room and a light walks in, no matter how dark it is, that light is going to show. And so Jesus is making it very clear, don't deny me before men. Don't, don't, don't be afraid to go in front of the magistrates. Listen, be bold. And here's how bold and courage comes. Look what he says. For the Holy Spirit will teach you. You see, bold and, boldness and courage come from the power of the Holy Spirit. That's why in Luke 11, just a chapter before, he says, listen, ask for the Holy Spirit. And when we ask for the Holy Spirit, he's faithful to give us the boldness and the courage we need in order to say or to do what he's calling us to do. Now, let me communicate. I'm sitting on an airplane. I'm sitting next to a Muslim guy. I'm a little nervous about sharing the gospel. I asked the Spirit of God, would you give me the power and the strength now to communicate? And he did. And this guy, he didn't receive the Lord, but he listened so intently. And I know a seed was planted. He was on his way to Morocco. And I pray and I continue to pray for him that the Lord would open up the door of salvation. It was the power of the Holy Spirit. It wasn't Chet. It was the opportunity for me to be able to communicate. I'll never forget, it was in Brazil. A guy had asked me to come and speak at a uh, uh, Bible study, and I didn't understand the Portuguese that he was trying to communicate with. Um, and I thought, oh, this is just a few people. So I showed up my shorts, I had my t-shirt. I thought it was just like a little home Bible study. What I didn't realize was that it was a city-wide fair. I go up to the guy, I find him in the middle of this whole fair. And then he goes, get ready, you're going on stage. I go, I'm going where? He goes, you're going on stage in 10 minutes. You're a little bit late. I go, oh yeah, I thought I was doing a little Bible study. You are, you're doing a Bible study to 10,000 people. That's what the disciples were facing. An innumerable crowd was there. And Jesus is using the experience of this innumerable crowd with enemies in it. The Pharisees were in it. He's saying, listen, ask for the power of the Spirit to help you be courageous. Don't care what they do to you. You just do what God's calling you to do. And ask for the power of the Spirit to give you the boldness to speak. Don't deny my name and go into this dark room or this inner place. No, no, no. I want you to be bold and courageous and you'll do it by the power of the Spirit. Well, take a look what happens in verse 13. Then one from the crowd said to him, teacher, tell my brother to divide the inheritance with me. Whew. I mean, think about this for just a minute. Here Jesus is using the opportunity to teach his disciples. Everyone's listening. Be bold, be courageous, have the power of the Holy Spirit. Speak to this crowd. Don't be afraid to communicate. I know the enemy's there in the midst. Beware of the, the, the leaven of the Pharisees, which is hypocrisy. You be bold, you be courageous. Jesus is not talking about inheritance. Jesus is not talking about the affairs going on with this guy. But this guy isn't listening. He just wants Jesus to be judge and jury. He respects Jesus. He sees this huge crowd is following him. So he wants to get Jesus' answer for a life situation that he's dealing with. He hasn't heard anything that Jesus has communicated to his disciples. Now, the Lord is going to turn this to continue his discipleship process with the disciples. Take a look. But he said to him, man, who made me a judge or an arbitrator over you? Now, usually Jewish questions are Jewish statements. And so Jesus asking a question is making a statement that he is the judge. And he said to them, take heed and beware of covetousness I want you to underline this in your Bible. For one's life does not consist in the abundance of the things he possesses. I've been in Orange County now for uh, five years. And as an outsider, as I have had people invest into my own life, I would say here in Orange County that this is a verse that really should be posted on every door, on every door frame as you walk into your house. Listen carefully again. Take heed and beware of covetousness, for one's life does not consist in the abundance of the things he possesses. Jesus is going straight to the heart. He's dealing with the issue of the money 
And, but he's more so dealing with the issue of this guy's heart. He wanted things and he wanted money and he wanted more of it. He wanted to be keeping up with the Joneses. Well, if they have it, I want it. My brother's got it and he better share it because I deserve it. I'm entitled to that. You hear all those words? I deserve, entitlement, covetousness. You've got to understand that Jesus is getting across a point. Listen, your life is not about what you own. Your life is not about what you possess. Your life needs to be about being bold and courageous for the gospel and using everything that God has blessed you with for advancing the kingdom of God. We are stewards. We're not owners. Everything belongs to God. He has blessed us with every good and perfect gift that comes from above. It comes from the Father of lights. It comes from God Almighty. He has blessed us with what we own, what we are stewards of, whether it's our home, whether it's our, uh, 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 the things that we own or the things that we possess, they come from God. They're owned by God. We're just stewards. And so this statement has got to kind of open our eyes a little bit to go, hmm, how am I being a steward of the house that God has given me? Is it my castle and no one can come into my domain? Or do I use it for ministry? Um, with the finances that God has blessed me with. How am I using that to advance the kingdom? So on Sunday, I make a plea and I say, hey, we are going to be ministering to pastors in Oaxaca. Does something happen in your heart where you go, there he goes, he's asking for money. Or does something happen in your heart where you go, man, advancing God's kingdom? I'm a steward. I want to be a part of that. You see, our attitude towards the things of God reflects our relationship with God. And so here we have this understanding. He says, listen, life doesn't consist in the abundance of the things he possesses. How much can we have? How many pair of socks, pair of shoes, t-shirts, how many do we actually need when the Israelites made it on a garment for 40 years? And the Lord said to him, look, did your shoes ever get holes? Did your garments ever tear? I can take care of you. That's why Jesus said in the Sermon on the Mount, and he's going to get to it later here once again. I want you to look at the sparrows and how I feed them and look at the lilies and how I clothe them. You can trust me, so be a good steward. Then he spoke a parable to them saying, the ground of a certain rich man yielded plentifully. Now I know that when we read rich man, a lot of us go, well, I'm not rich. The very fact that we can go to Starbucks and buy a $4 drink the very fact that we can go to Starbucks and buy a $4 drink, which is what a lot of the world survives on for a month. Let this parable speak to all of us. I was walking in the Bahamas with a good friend of mine, and he was looking at someone who owned this 90-foot yacht, and they were sitting in the back, and he really began to degrade them and say, I can't believe they would own that yacht. So I continued to walk down the harbor, and we went to Starbucks and got a drink. And as soon as he bought his drink, I looked at him and I said, I can't believe you just bought that drink. He's like, what are you talking about? It's just Starbucks. And I said to him what I communicated. You see, we all look at wealthy as other people because other people, someone always has more than us. So we don't ever apply these parables to us because we don't consider ourselves to be wealthy. We consider someone else to be. So they're worthy to be judged. But how I steward what God has given me and the portion that he's given me is just as important. So this parable is for us. The ground of a certain rich man yielded plentifully. So God blessed him. And he thought within himself saying, what shall I do since I have no room to store my crops? So he said, I'll do this. I give to the poor. That's not what he said. Take a look. I will pull down my barns. I'm going to build greater. And there I'll store all my crops and my goods. And I'll say to my soul, soul, you have many goods laid up for many years. Take your ease, eat, drink, and be merry. Stop there if you would for just a minute. So this guy, he looks at God's blessing. He knows he's a steward. God is plentiful. I mean, he has overwhelmed him. So he decides, you know what I'm going to do? I'm going to keep it all for myself. I'm going to be selfish. That's what I'm going to do. I want you to see what happens in verse 20. But God said to him, fool. Now, if you remember in Matthew chapter 5, 
Jesus said, don't use this word. Jesus said, don't ever call someone a fool. And here God is calling him a fool. But God said to him, fool, this night your soul will be required of you. Then whose will those things be which you have provided? In other words, a little sarcasm. Um, You're going to be gone. You think it's all about you and that you did this. So um, who are they going to when you're gone? And he called him a fool. You see, God is the perfect judge and he knows what a fool is. But he tells humanity, don't ever call anyone a fool because you're not a perfect judge. You don't know all of the pieces. So don't you do it. But God is the perfect judge. He's able to say, this is a fool. A fool is someone who desires everything for themselves. A fool is someone who looks at all that they have and instead of choosing to give, which is the essence of the gospel, they choose to get. They choose to keep for themselves. He says, that is a fool for from God's perspective. And he says, listen, don't you know that your, your, that your soul will be required of you? Verse 21, so, so is he who lays up treasure for himself and is not rich toward God. Now remember, the Pharisees are in this innumerable crowd. The Lord is speaking to the disciples in front of this innumerable crowd. And he says, be rich toward God. The Lord is turning it around. He's telling them, beware of the leaven of the Pharisees. And here's one of the leaven. The Lord's using it. You see, one of the leaven of the Pharisees, one of the hypocritical ways of the Pharisees was this guy. You see, Pharisees, they had all the money. They were the wealthy. They were the elite. In fact, so much so, you remember the story of the rich young ruler. He comes with all of his pomp and circumstance because there was a belief that if you were rich and wealthy, you were blessed of God. If you had leprosy, you were cursed of God like Miriam, the sister of Moses, who is married to Aaron. And so the rich young ruler comes in on the scene and says, Jesus, what must I do to be saved? Well, Jesus quotes a couple of the commandments and he says, I've done all these things to my youth. He says, okay, then go and sell all that you have and give to the poor. Rich man walked away because you can't buy your salvation. There's nothing that you can do for your salvation. But you see, this rich man had a belief. And this belief was, I'm blessed of God. Look, it's obvious with all this money that I have. But that's a false belief. Because I know a lot of poor people that live in the jungles of Africa. They're blessed of God. Now, their blessings look a lot different than maybe our blessings do. But they believe more in the glory of heaven than establishing heaven on earth. And I love, and one of the reasons I love going to third world countries is because it's a reminder. Their songs are about heaven, not about how to be a better person on earth. Their songs are about Jesus and being with him in heaven because all they have to look forward to is that great eternal day. But I fear that sometimes here in the United States of America, we try to create our own little heaven on earth and try to live here forever. But what Jesus is communicating to the disciples is, listen, you see this, the Pharisees, they're in this crowd, right? They've got these robes on that cost millions of dollars, thousands of dollars. They've got these phylacteries on their head. They've got bands around their arm. They look the part and they're so wealthy and they believe they're blessed of God, but they're not rich toward the things of God. They're selfish. They're a fool. The Lord goes on to explain and he repeats again a portion of the Sermon on the Mount. Then he said to his disciples, therefore, I say to you, don't worry about what, about the body. Remember what he told them. Don't be afraid of those who can kill the body. Don't don't worry about what you're going to eat, nor about the body or what you're going to put on. Life is more than food and the body is more than clothing. Consider the ravens. I wonder a raven just happens to fly by right there at this moment. Consider the ravens. They neither sow nor reap, which which have neither storehouse nor barn. And God feeds them. Of how much more value of, of you, uh, excuse me, of how much more value are you than the birds? This is the second value statement. Earlier, it was in regards to being afraid and he wants us to be courageous. And he says, listen, you're so valuable, God knows how many hairs are on your head. 
Here, another value statement. How much more valuable are you? Do you realize that? You see, oftentimes we find our value in our job. We find our value in our friends. We find our value in what people say about us. Or we find our value in being a parent. We find our value in how much money we have or what our portfolio looks like. But the only place that we can really find our value, the only place that we'll truly understand what it means to be fulfilled is when we see our value through the eyes of God and that God values us and that our value is found in him. So he goes on to say, and which of you by worrying can add one cubit to his stature? If you then are not able to do the least, why are you anxious for the rest? So why are you worried about things that you really can't even help with? Consider the lilies, how they grow. They neither toil nor spin. They're not worried. They're not upset. They're not freaking about about what's going to happen to them. And yet I say to you, even Solomon in all of his glory was not arrayed like one of these. If then God so clothes the grass, which today is in the field and tomorrow is thrown into the oven, how much more will he clothe you? Here's the issue. O you of little faith. The Pharisees were concerned about what they looked like. The Pharisees were concerned about how much money they had or what they ate. But the believer, the disciple, no, it's an issue of faith. I trust God for the t-shirt that I've got on. I trust God for the shoes that I've got on. And if I can afford these shoes, I'm thankful that God allows me to afford these shoes. I don't feel guilty for purchasing the things that I need in order to be able to live in my community. That's not the point here but I'm thankful for these shoes. And they may not be the $300 pair, but they're my shoes and they're what God has provided for me. They fit in my budget. And I trust God that what he has for me, well, Paul said it like this, it's important. Godliness with contentment is great gain. I'm thankful for God's provision for my life. And he goes on in verse 29 and says, don't seek what you should eat or what you should drink, nor have an anxious mind. For all these things the nations of the world seek after, and your Father knows that you need these things. But seek the kingdom of God, and all these things shall be added to you. And get your focus right. Purpose to be focused on the things of God. Be bold and be courageous about the things of God. Don't worry about how it's going to affect you. You trust God and be obedient to what he's asking you to do and watch how God will bless you and take care of you. And I'm 50 years old and I look back and I see how God, I remember our accountant, Uh, One year he said, uh, uh, there was a guy who volunteered his time at a church that we were part of and he was our accountant and he would uh, do our taxes and help us for free. And he would say every year, he goes, I don't know how you make it with nine children. And I would always say, by the grace of God. And as Andre and I look back and we see how God's provision has been there for us, let me say these words are true. When you seek God and you seek his kingdom first and your focus is kingdom and it's not making money, it's not getting the best new thing, it's not having the greater portfolio. When you're really truly seeking God, all of those things are just a part. In other words, having a relationship with God, what we were created for, having a relationship with God should be our greatest priority. Trust God with where he places you, the job that you have, the money that you have, and be faithful within your budget as to what God has provided so that you can live within the means that God has blessed you with. Don't fear, little flock, for it's your father's good pleasure to give you the kingdom. Did you hear that? Sell what you have and give alms. Provide yourselves money bags which don't grow old, a treasure in the heavens that doesn't fail where no thief approaches nor moth destroys, for where your treasure is, there your heart will be also. One of the greatest areas of discipleship is when God begins to affect your pocket. When you start realizing the essence of the gospel, and the essence of the gospel is to give. Now, it's not just give of your uh, treasure. It's give of your time. It's give of your talent. It's giving of your testimony to where your life is all about the things of God. Listen to what the Lord said. He's affecting the pocket. For where your treasure is, there your heart will be also. I remember uh, there was a month, it took 30 days to watch where my treasure went. And I was surprised. Well, 
I really treasured Home Depot. And I found I spent a lot of money that month on DeWalt. And I remember that month embarrassed of the amount of money that I spent in Home Depot worshiping the DeWalt, the DeWalt section. For where your treasure is, there your heart will be also. For me, it was a wake-up call. I wonder if we were just to do maybe just a 30-day look at our budget in regards to how much we spend at Starbucks. I wonder if we were to take a look at our budget and see, well, how much do we spend? And maybe you call your special topic and just look at it over the last 30 days. Don't do it for the next 30 days, for of the last 30 days. Because if you do it in the next 30 days, you're going to be a little bit more cautious and careful. But take a look back and see if there's a possibility with some of that discretionary dollars that maybe instead of going for you, they go towards the kingdom. And that you're living your life not simply to get, but that you're living your life to give. Beware of the leaven of the Pharisees. They lived to get, but the believer lives to give. Let's pray. Father, I'm so thankful for your word, and I pray that as we've gone through this section, that we will beware of the leaven of the Pharisees, that we won't even allow a little bit of these things, and whether it's greed or fear or doubt, that we would not allow a little leaven, because that will leaven our whole lump. That will just make our whole lump of dough get big with sinfulness. And so I pray that we would not be the hypocrite. I pray that you'd give us by the power of your spirit, boldness and courage to be able to say what needs to be said when it needs to be said. And I pray, Lord, that we would not be the fool, that we'd be rich towards the things of God and that our heart would be to give and not to get. Lord, you've given us all that we need. Allow our relationship with you to completely satisfy us. In Jesus' name, amen. We call this community at Coast because now it's our opportunity to break into our life groups. And so I'm gonna ask that you will go ahead and go into your Zoom rooms or in your home Bible study area and go ahead and start the connection um, for being in your life group. If you don't have a life group, we wanna welcome you. And there's an opportunity for you to go right into a Zoom room. So if you'll see that connect tab, go ahead and click that connect tab and that'll take you right into uh, very, very, very good friends of mine who will welcome you and have spiritual conversation about the Bible study we just talked about. God bless you guys. We'll see you next week.